All right, uh, hello everybody. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm gonna give a kind of schizophrenic talk um, because I wanna talk about private communication, but I've also been thinking a lot about American action movies. And um, judging from the selection available in my hotel room, it seems that uh, American action movies are available in this country and quite popular. Uh, so I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about them because I've been thinking about them. Uh, and I've been thinking mostly about the American action movie as a reflection of the American social narrative. Basically, you know, the things that we're all thinking about. Uh, how do we perceive the world? Uh, what are the uh, ideas that we all sort of collectively have in common? And <clears throat> so what I did was I, I went back in time and I looked at the IMDb movie ratings for every American action movie from like the 1980s until present. Uh, and I looked at the highest grossing films. Uh, so if you start in the 1980s, um, this is, you know, like the movies of my childhood, right? Um, first, 1983 or 1984, Red Dawn. Uh, this is a film about a Soviet invasion of the United States, uh, where uh, the opening scene is these like Soviet paratroopers parachuting out of planes uh, onto the high school football field of like a Midwest American high school. Uh, and this um, small band of high school students manages to escape the invasion, flee to the hills where they uh, wage guerrilla warfare against the Soviet invasion. Um, I used to like sit in my middle school math class every day, staring out the window hoping to see Russian paratroopers, you know, parachuting down. Anything would have been better, right? Uh, 1985, Top Gun. Uh, again, canonical 80s uh, American action film. This is about uh, American fighter pilots. Um, you know, there's this sort of interpersonal drama, but really the larger narrative of the movie is the conflict between uh, the Soviet and the American fighter pilots. Um, excellent film. 1986, uh, Rocky IV. This is, I think, the best of the Rocky movies. Uh, in this version of Rocky, Rocky boxes the Soviet boxer. Um, and the Soviet boxer is like the product of Russian engineering. Oh, you're saying the actual actor yeah. is Swedish. Wow, you guys are quick to correct me on that. Uh, <laughs> but as the story goes, uh, he was a, a Soviet, uh, you know, uh, Soviet boxer. He's like the product of Russian science. You know, there's all the training scenes, you know, and he has all the stuff hooked up to his body. They're like injecting stuff into his arms. The scientists are all around him. They're measuring things on machines. Um, Rocky, um, on the other hand, is just like some guy, right? And he trains by like running through the snow, uh, and he actually saws logs as part of his like strength training, you know? Um, 1989, Hunt for Red October, another amazing canonical 80s uh, action movie. This one, Sean Connery is the captain of a Soviet submarine. Um, he's actually defecting, but the drama is that, you know, the um, American military doesn't know what's going on. This submarine that he's in uh, is the super advanced submarine that uh, is undetectable uh, by you know, normal means. So if you look at all of the, the really high grossing uh, 80s action films throughout the decade, um, they're all uh, about the Cold War, right? Every single one of them. And um, what's amazing about this decade is that the Soviet them is like, perfect. It's this really sort of powerful them. Uh, and if you can create a really powerful them, it implies an us. You know, if you've got a them, you've got to have an us, right? And the thing about them is like what was so great about them is they were like not human. You know, they, they were uh, these sort of monsters, right? You know, like, uh, you know, you look at the, the boxer in Rocky, um, he's not a person. He's like a product of engineering, you know? If you look at the fighter pilots in any of the, the Top Gun scenes, you know, whenever they depict the American fighter pilots, you can always see their eyes. Whenever they show the Soviet fighter pilots, they're just faceless. You know, they're just these like 
you know, machines, these non-existent monsters, right? And the Americans are always the underdog. You know, like the MiGs in the, in the you know, Top Gun scene are superior to the American airplanes. You know, the, the, the Russian submarine in Hunt for Red October is undetectable. Uh, you know, if you look at Rocky, you know, he's like a foot smaller than this guy. He's like tiny, you know. We're always the underdogs. Um, you know, they always have superior technology, but we have heart. You know, that's, and that's how, you know, we prevail every time. Now, the thing about creating a really powerful them and defining an us is that it makes it very difficult to be at all critical of us, you know? Any kind of critique about us must mean that you're one of them. You know, if you do engage in any kind of internal critique, that means you're not one of us, you must be one of them, you know? Um, and that was, I think, what was so powerful about that narrative in, in the 1980s. Then if you start looking at the action films of the 1990s, what's amazing is that post-91, fall of the Soviet Union, um, there's nothing. There's not a single high-grossing action film for the first half of the 1990s. It's like the, the, the film writers just didn't know what to do. You know, like they had this perfect story and they could just churn them out, you know, and like they knew it so well. And then post-91, they were just totally lost. There's not a single high-grossing action film for the first half of the decade. And then something very interesting happens. In 1995, Braveheart. This is the story of a Scottish commoner who is rebelling against his own oppressive government. Uh, also in 1995, Hackers comes out, um, ostensibly uh, an action film. Uh, this is the story of uh, you know, these innocent hackers who are persecuted by um, both large corporations and uh, the US federal government. Their only crime was curiosity. Um, 1998, um, this Will Smith movie comes out, Enemy of the State. Uh, the interesting thing about this film is that like, the villain in this film was the NSA. It was the NSA in 1998. You know, is the story of this large government agency that had gone out of control, it lost its focus, and had turned it inwards you know, on its own citizens. Also in 1999, The Matrix, also sort of the story of uh, you know, people uh, fighting in rebellion against their own oppressive environment. Uh, in 1999 as well, this sort of cult film that was actually really high grossing, Worldwide Battle Royale. It's a Japanese film about um, these students who are basically fighting against this older generation who put them into this sort of Hunger Games-like situation. It's basically the original Hunger Games. And then in 2000, the first of the, the Born, Born series, Born Identity movies. Again, this is a story about a government agency that has gotten too large, lost its focus, gone out of control, and is focusing inward against its own people. So if you look at all of the high-grossing films of the 1990s, there's really no clear them. You know, it's not like the 1980s where you could define this them and an us. Instead, it's really stories of power versus people over and over again. Then, of course, the 2000s, 2001, everything changes. And the first half of the 2000s, um, all of the films are really about terrorism. And what's interesting is that it didn't work at first. Like, if you look at sort of the attempts at action films in the early 2000s, post-2001, they're all this sort of confused story about, you know, uh, there's this guy, we capture him, uh, there's a bomb hidden somewhere in the city, do we torture him? I don't know, what a dilemma. Um, and it, 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 it wasn't really that compelling. And then, in the sort of mid-half of the decade, it really starts to catch on in the form of narrative. Um, or, uh, the form of metaphor. So, you know, all of the, the sort of Marvel Comics series movies um, really play this out in, uh, a, in a way that people really engaged with. You know, the original Batman film is, is, is that story, right? You know, you have this sort of, you know, world where there's this sort of, um, everyone is sort of vaguely corrupt or nepotistic, sort of unworthy, uh, you know, corrupted people. There's this uh, group of bad people who destroy civilizations. It's not clear why, that's just what they do. And then there's this virtuous few, you know, who are actually righteous, and they save all of us, even though we don't even deserve it. You know, it's almost a fascist message. Um, you know, the Transformers film, same thing. 
all of the, the X-Men stuff, same thing. The worst offender is the original Captain American movie. I mean, this is just terrible. And I think it all culminates in uh, 2009 with this film Taken, uh, which I think is really representative of an entire decade. They do it perfectly where, you know, there's this sort of vaguely Eastern European bad people who are just bad. And, uh, you know, they kidnap two 16-year-old American girls from, like, you know, affluent neighborhood in Paris. Nobody is safe. And who saves the day? The CIA, operated from, CIA agent from the 1980s who we all thought, you know, was obsolete. Um, so in the early, you know, 2000s, it's all about the terrorists, them. And again, a them implies an us. Um, so if you, you know, graph all of this out on this really terrible timeline, uh, you know, you get these clear, uh, you know, series of narrative over a few decades, right? Cold War, power versus people, terrorism. And the reason I think that this is kind of interesting is because when I think of the hacker community or the hacker scene, to me, that really sort of ignited or came together and, 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 and you know, really became a force in about 1995 which is right in the middle of this decade of power versus people. And so I think, to a, in a sense, that that narrative is sort of baked into us, you know, that it's, it's sort of a part of our DNA, um, that it's our origin story and where we come from. And so here we are, you know, at the beginning of a new decade, right? Um, this decade of terrorism is kind of coming to an end in terms of, you know, narrative, at least reflection in action films. Um, and if you look at the action films that have started to emerge in this decade, uh, you know, there are things like Hunger Games or, you know, this recent film Elysium. And both of these are, again, somewhat stories of power versus people. So I think, you know, in looking forward into the rest of this decade, what are the action movies of this decade going to be and how will they reflect our social narrative? I think it's, it's looking somewhat like a return to power versus people again. Now, I think this is interesting to think about because I, I think that we as a community are actually central to this decade's narrative, that we're actually really well positioned right now to you know, define what it is that we're thinking about, the terms that we're considering the world, right? And I, you know, as part of that, am interested in thinking about private communication. And I, I work on an open source project called Open Whisper Systems. And, um, you know, we've been thinking a lot about private messaging in particular. And when we first started looking at private messaging and sort of approaching this problem or this question, the first thing we did was look at the state of the universe. And the state of the universe at that time was really composed of two worlds, right? There's like the PGP world and then the OTR world, off the record messaging. And if you, you know, zoom in and you look at the PGP world, um, first of all, it's a total nightmare. Uh, you know, you have this software that is utterly and completely unusable. Um, at some point, you know, people realized people didn't know how to use PGP, and then they thought, okay, well, the problem is user education. So we ended up with these like 100-page tutorials with links to learn more, um, and that didn't really seem to be effective. When we look at the protocol um, that PGP employs, any protocol, any secure protocol, needs to provide three things. Confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. The way PGP works, if you have somebody like Alice, um, and Alice wants to communicate securely, Alice will have a key that she publishes publicly. Then anybody that wants to communicate with Alice encrypts some stuff to that same key, which generates ciphertext that they then transmit to Alice. Um, conversely, if uh, Alice uh, wants to send someone a message, the first thing she might do is sign that message. Uh, she takes her plain text, she signs it with her private key, and she produces this signed plain text that she then goes on to en encrypt to somebody else. So it, it, the problems inherent in this sort of approach are one, that everybody is encrypting everything all the time with the same key. So anytime anybody sends a message to Alice, they're just using the same key over and over and over again. So if you have a network adversary that just hangs out and uh, just watches the network and records a copy of every piece of ciphertext that goes by, and we now know that there are some network adversaries that do stuff like that, 
if at any point in the future that adversary then manages to somehow compromise Alice's private key, maybe just by physically going to Alice and you know, seizing her device, they can, can then go back and decrypt every single copy of ciphertext that they ever saw transmitted uh, to Alice. You know, that could be years worth of communication. So uh, this is the lack of what's known as forward secrecy. Um, the second problem um, is that you know, if Alice is doing this digital signing stuff in order to um, provide authenticity or, or, or integrity for the message that she transmits, um, you know, if Alice sends me a message and it's signed, I can then just put that message on the internet and say, hey, look what Alice wrote. And there's no way for Alice to deny that she wrote it um, because it's signed by Alice and anybody can verify the signature. And so this is a, a missing property that's known as deniability. So in a lot of ways, um, you know, when you look at PGP, it's sort of an architectural dead end. Um, it's really sort of, it's, you know, a protocol and a piece of software that was designed um, in the same era as Lotus Notes. And nobody uses Lotus Notes anymore. Um, so I don't know why we should expect that this is going to be any more usable. Um, you know, then, you know, if you go and you look at the, the OTR world, um, OTR was designed specifically to address these problems of, you know, missing forward secrecy and deniability. They wanted to design a protocol uh, that provided these properties. And so the way that uh, OTR works is that you start off by doing an ephemeral key exchange. So the first thing that two people do when they need to communicate is exchange keys. Um, and those keys are signed by long-term identity keys. Um, and uh, the, the actual key exchange is a little bit more complicated. They use a, uh, a, a protocol called Sigma to do identity hiding as they do it. Then after you've done this key exchange, um, every time you transmit a message using this shared secret uh, from the key exchange, you also include one half of a new key exchange. So you include a, a new uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange value in, in, in with the message that you transmit. Um, and then you know, when Bob responds to Alice, he includes his own uh, you know, ephemeral uh, key exchange. Um, and so with each round trip, you're able to negotiate a new secret and roll the key material forward, right? So you know, these are color-coded, right? Where you know, the first encrypted message is blue from the first key exchange. Uh, the second you know, message is green, which is you know, encrypted with the second uh, key exchange, yellow, and so on, right? So this is what we call a three-step ratchet, where as you communicate, the key material is constantly changing. Um, so um, this protocol works really well for, and is really designed for um, clients like this. Uh, this is a, a client called Pigeon, which is like an XMPP chat client. It's basically modeled after AOL Instant Messenger. Um, this is a single device, synchronous online client. Both parties are on the internet at the same time with a single device that they use to communicate with each other. The problem is that more and more people are using messaging apps that look like this. Um, you know, Facebook chat, or uh, WhatsApp, or Google chat, or Hangouts. These are all asynchronous, multi-device chat protocols. Uh, so both parties don't need to be online at the same time. Uh, you know, if someone isn't online, you just send the message and they get it whenever their you know, phone comes back into service. Uh, you know, you can have multiple devices, you know, your phone, your tablet, uh, and your desktop computer that all receive these synchronized messages. Um, so you know, OTR doesn't really work in these environments. Um, so if you look at you know, OTR in the modern world, the real obstacles are that um, with OTR, you need at least one round trip before you can even start a conversation. So we have to do a key exchange as, as the first thing that we do. You know, if I want to send you a message, I want to just send you the message. I don't want to have to like, send you a key and then wait for you to like send a key back, and then I can send the message. Um, there's no way to support multiple devices uh, with OTR as it's currently specialized or specified. The ratcheting is slow, uh, which means that this Diffie-Hellman ratchet, uh, you know, happens. It's a, it's a three-step ratchet. It has to happen, you know, uh, in three exchanges. Uh, whereas, you know, with these uh, new environments that are fundamentally asynchronous, sessions are really long-lived. You know, uh, you know, you can have a session that's years long. You know, I might send you a message and you might not respond for 24 hours. And so the, the ratchet is sort of slow for environments like that. 
And then uh, also the conversation is only partially deniable, um, that some of the stuff that they had to do uh, with OTR when they introduced this Sigma handshake protocol um, made it so it, they, they don't get as much deniability as you might want. And so, you know, I felt like, you know, we were at this stage where, you know, a lot of people were looking at, you know, things like Hangouts um, and uh, things like Facebook Messenger and saying, hey, you know, Facebook or Google, what are you doing? Why don't you integrate OTR into these uh, Messenger apps? But in reality, th that wasn't really possible, that, um, you know, they, they aren't the best fit for each other. Um, so what we wanted to do was increase the state of the art for secure communication and secure messaging and simultaneously reduce the friction for ordinary people to make use of it. Um, and so we started by thinking about a new protocol, uh, which we call Axolotl. And the first thing we do is, you know, look at this key exchange construction, right? Uh, so you have this, these two ephemeral keys that are exchanged, they're signed by these long-term identity keys. And those signatures make uh, deniability really hard. Anytime you include a signature, it, uh, it makes things a little bit more difficult. And so what we did was we actually used a, a different kind of construction that we call a triple Diffie-Hellman, where you actually do three Diffie-Hellman key exchanges without any signatures at all. And then you concatenate all that key material together, run it through a key derivation function, and you get your shared secret out. Um, it turns out that if you do that, you can really simplify all the other deniability aspects of a protocol like OTR. OTR was doing uh, a, a lot of contortions like publishing MAC keys in the clear and stuff like that. And you can just get rid of all of that stuff uh, just with this one simple construction. So if we look at you know, the, sort of our obstacles in, uh, for uh, an asynchronous messaging protocol, um, you know, that will take care of the, the partial deniability problem. Um, so the next thing that we do is, you know, we have this construction, but we still have to do this key exchange, right, where two parties have to exchange keys, and that's sort of unasynchronous. Um, and so we introduce this concept of what we call pre-keys. So the way it works is that, you know, at the beginning of time, Alice has generated her long-term static identity key, and then she has, she generates a whole list of, of ephemeral key pairs. And she sends all of those to the messaging server. And these are just the public values. The server doesn't know any uh, secret values or you know, uh, anything private. And um, those just sit in a queue. And then if Bob wants to send a message to Alice, and Alice might be offline, you know, Bob has his own identity key. And when he wants to initiate a session with Alice, he generates his own uh, ephemeral uh, key pair. And then he issues a request to the server. And the server transmits uh, a copy of Alice's identity key, and then the next uh, public ephemeral from Alice's queue, the server removes and sends that to, to Bob. Now, Bob does his triple Divi Hellman calculation on his end, um, you know, all by himself, and then he packages up everything that uh, he needs uh, into one message. So he includes the pre key ID, so this is the, the ID of the ephemeral that the server just uh, sent to Bob. He includes his own ephemeral public key, he includes his own public identity key. And then he uh, includes the ciphertext that he's able to encrypt as a result of this triple Diffie Hellman exchange. And then he sends that all in one big package over to Alice. And Alice doesn't even have to be online at the time. You know, it'll get queued. Uh, you know, eventually Alice will receive this, net, this, this message at some point in the future. And Alice has everything that she needs to decrypt it and initiate a session right there, even if Bob's not online anymore. Um, so uh, at that point, uh, you know, we have uh, a mechanism that is uh, conducive to asynchronous environments, and that it also simultaneously enables um, a multi-device environment, because you can just have, you know, one identity key across all of your devices, and then different uh, pre-key queue for each device. Um, so then, you know, we're faced with this problem where we have this sort of slow ratchet, which isn't great for asynchronous messaging either. So what we do is, um, you know, if you look at, um, you know, the way that Diffie-Hellman worked, or I'm sorry, the way that OTR works, they do this Diffie-Hellman ratchet, right, where they're including this one half of a, a key exchange with the, every message that they send. Um, there's a different protocol that's called SCIMP, um, and they have a different approach to, to ratcheting. And the way it works is, you know, you have a message, you encrypt a message with, that, with a key, and you get ciphertext. You send that ciphertext uh, over to Bob, and as soon as you've sent the ciphertext to Bob, as soon as it's away, uh, you hash your key uh, to get another key, and then you immediately delete the original key. 
So since you have a one-way hash function, you can't go back in time from key two to rediscover key one. And as soon as you send the message to Bob, you can basically iterate to key two, delete key one, uh, and Bob does the same thing on his end as soon as he receives and decrypts the message. Uh, you got another message you want to send, you encrypt that with key two, you send that over to Bob, and you immediately uh, iterate up to key three and delete key two. Um, so this is a kind of an interesting approach, um, and it has a really great forward secrecy that as soon as you send a message, you can delete the key. As soon as you receive a message, you can delete the key. And that's kind of what you want. You want to just be getting, getting rid of keys as quickly as you can. Um, but it's not, it has a, a somewhat different property than this Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and then it's not self-healing. If you look at the sort of moment of compromise um, you know, between these two protocols, you can see that um, you know, what's good is that right at the moment of compromise, everything in SCIMP before that moment is totally good. In OTR world with the stiffy hellman ratchet, there's a, a short little space where everything, you know, a few things just before the moment of compromise aren't good. They're not protected. Um, but stiffy hellman will self-heal. Um, since you're generating new ephemerals and exchanging them with every message, that eventually you'll recover from that key compromise event as you roll forward into the future. And so, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. And what you really want is the best of both worlds. You want something that is perfectly good uh, in terms of, you know, at the moment of compromise looking backwards, but is also self-healing. And so what we do is we actually just combine both concepts, where we have two ratchets that are running simultaneously. One is the stiffy hellman ratchet that happens with each message exchange, and then the other is the hash ratchet that happens in each direction for every message that you send before you get a response. Um, and we include a little uh, bit of other magic in here um, to differentiate message keys and chain keys to get us some nice properties for some other uh, situations. Um, so when you graph this out, you get this nice little graph uh, where you have you know, this, this sort of root key that's progressing through time and you have these chains that branch off and then you have these message keys that branch off from that. Um, and it, it actually is pretty simple to implement uh, in code. So at that point, we've you know, addressed all of these protocol shortcomings in terms of getting a, a forward secure, deniable um, ratcheting message protocol into an asynchronous environment. Uh, and along the way, we developed some ideology. Uh, first, it's, it's an asynchronous world that you know, today we need to really be designing for asynchronous systems. Um, second, uh, if it's like PGP, it's wrong. PGP is our spirit guide for what not to do. Um, that if you know, people suggest to us you should do this thing, it's sort of like PGP, we just stop reading. You know? um, the third is that a user doesn't know what a key is, and we shouldn't expect them to know. Um, fourth, there are, there are no power users. There are people that think that they're power users, um, but that's different. And um, lastly, the answer is never more options. Um, so, you know. Using that ideology as a guiding force and you know, working with this protocol, uh, we develop a couple of applications. Um, one is called Redphone, it's uh, for secure calls, and the other is called TechSecure, which is an asynchronous uh, messaging app. And um, our hope is that you know, we can, that, that TechSecure is something that you already know how to use. It's basically just like any other messaging app, uh, except all of this stuff is you know, happening with every message that you send. Um, but it has all the features that you would expect from a modern asynchronous matching app. It has you know, uh, group messaging. You can define groups with an you know, avatar icon and a group name. And none of the information, like the list of members in the group or the group avatar icon or the group name, are ever uh, revealed to the server or uh, to a network attacker. And after developing this app, uh, we were also able to do an integration with um, a project called CyanogenMod. Uh, Cyanogen Mod is an aftermarket Android ROM. Uh, they're the most popular aftermarket Android ROM. Uh, they have over 10 million users. Um, and what we did was work with them to integrate this protocol, the TechSecure protocol, uh, into the actual SMS provider on the system. So you can use any SMS app that you want uh, on Cyanogen. And if you send an SMS message to someone else who happens to be a Cyanogen Mod user, or just a normal tech secure user, it automatically gets encrypted um, at the system level, you know, without the, without the app even really knowing what's going on. 
Um, so that looks like this. Um, you know, this is just uh, a stock messenger app running on Cyanogen. Um, you know, having a hypothetical conversation with you know another phone that's uh, also running Cyanogen, and um, you know it looks identical to a normal conversation. It's actually uh, it is identical. There is n no difference at all uh, in, in user experience. But these messages are uh, behind the scenes being encrypted using this uh, forward secure asynchronous messaging protocol, uh, which I think is really where we want to be, or at least you know, the, the, the frontier that we want to explore, you know, making something that is really completely invisible to the user uh, with the experience that they know and expect. And I think it's, you know, a long way from, you know, where we've been uh, in the PGP world of, you know, really sort of difficult, confusing um, software. And um, everything that we've developed is open source. So uh, we want to make it easy for existing projects uh, companies and products to take what we've done and integrate it into their products as seamlessly as possible by providing open source libraries and uh, you know uh, a protocol that isn't encumbered by patent restrictions or any other intellectual intellectual property and making it free for any, everybody. Um, so that's what we've been working on, and uh, that's it. <laughs>